we're going to talk about what we do in the retreatment setting when something else has been done to a patient and that um, they either have a failure of that procedure or um, need retreatment because of regrowth of prostate. Um, and we'll specifically be talking about whole man laser and nucleation of the prostate. So if you're trying to decide on the best surgical option for your BPH patient, there is guidance in this regard. I have here algorithms from both the EAU and the AUA guidelines. And I don't expect you to, to, to look at all the, the details of these, but suffice to say they have commonality in that they break down treatment recommendations by prostate size. This is one of the things that's new about the AUA guidelines is that we actually now recommend that you size a prostate before you go about deciding on a treatment. But I think what you'll see in both guidelines is that Holmian laser enucleation of the prostate or enucleation, endoscopic enucleation, is prominently um, displayed as an option for prostates really of all size in the AUA guidelines and for prostates over 30 cc's in the EAU uh, guidelines. So I'm not talking about anything experimental here. There's been a global trend, I think, towards endoscopic enucleation. I'm talking about holmium enucleation, but the, the, the premise is that the energy source is really irrelevant. It's the technique. It's the complete removal of transitional zone of the prostate that's going to give you the best results, whether you use holmium, thulium, monopolar, bipolar, uh, green light. Um, and in fact, uh, Dr. Rossweiler and the um, EAU section on urotechnology has said that in fact endoscopic enucleation may be better than monopolar or bipolar enucleation because you can resect a larger amount of tissue in a shorter, in the same operative time with a shorter hospitalization, uh, lower risk of complications, and lower reintervention rate. These are things that we like, okay? Well, what, what are we doing with holmium laser nucleation or endoscopic nucleation? When we use holmium, I, I mentioned in my other talk, um, we're using a wavelength that's highly absorbed by water and has a depth of penetration of about 0.4 millimeters. The idea is we are simulating open, simple prostatectomy by removing all of the adenoma, and in that way, it's a size-independent option. So you might ask me, so what's the evidence? Why on earth does it end up that way in all the guidelines? You don't have to squint, I'm gonna tell you. Level one evidence, 15 randomized controlled trials. There are about five in all of Stone disease that have shown a benefit to laser nucleation over open prostatectomy and TURP. So that's all fine and good. Let me show you some cases because I think we're talking about it in the retreatment setting. This is a gentleman of mine who um, came after having had two TURPs in, in one year. Um, he was a young man, um, had really severe, he never got better after the second, his first treatment. He was in the hospital 10 days on CBI. Um, and when I saw him, his PSA was 16, so I got this MRI. Let's see if we can get it to play. Uh, there it goes. Suffice to say, he has a lot of prostate left, okay? <laughs> Two TURPs, all right? And when I examine him, he has a big, long abdominal scar, and he says to me, yeah, doc, I got a hell of a lot of mesh in there, okay? So if we think about, well, maybe robotic, simple prostatectomy is a really good choice. For this guy, that's not going to be a really good choice. Um, and so I took him to the operating room. I had already uh, scoped him in the office. What he had was a complete fibrotic tissue bridge between the lateral lobes of the prostate, uh, to the point where I couldn't even get a scope into the bladder, a flexible cystoscope. So I took him to the operating room, and uh, the first thing I did with the laser was try to incise this tissue bridge and make my way uh, into the bladder. You know, I have, like, no landmarks, essentially, except the apex at this point. Um, but I know at some point I'm going to hit an anterior plane and be able to get between the two uh, lobes of the prostate because I really need to disconnect the left and the right sides before I can um, know how you know how do I go about you know getting these pieces out. It's too big to take out as one large piece. Um, I was going to just let this video play a little bit, but um, one of the things you can see about the Holmium laser is that it's so pinpoint. I mean, I can fire it exactly where I want it to go, and for this particular case, very useful. Here, am I, here I am at the apex, because what I want to do is I want to define the depth for the apical of the section. So I'll incise that mucosa, and then I'll use the beak of the telescope to actually push the, um, the uh, transitional zone off of the 
uh, peripheral zone. And now I am getting closer and closer to being able to get uh, into the bladder. This is all, you know, real, real time. But that also, making that apical decision, now I, I know exactly, you know, how far I have to cut back. I finally made it into the bladder. Uh, there's a lot of prostate that was still going into the bladder, and then I'm gonna go ahead and make this um, complete incision at about the six o'clock position. And then I'll go ahead and um, incise the other apex. The concept is I wanna use as much blunt nucleation as I can. And actually, if you're in the right plane, as you can see here, I can fire this laser in non-contact and the plane will separate. Um, I'll go and I'll make the uh, 12 o'clock incision now. What I'm looking for is where I came around from below. So I've done this, and now I'm cutting back, and I should, if I'm lucky, fall into my, the other space. Um, but you can see, I mean, this is a huge prostate, so you have to make this, uh, this incision fairly deep. But I think the other thing about, that's interesting is the, he had two TURs, the plane is pristine. There was, they're nowhere near the, the capsule in either of those operations. So I've just joined the two. I'm able to come around uh, the whole lobe and then push it up into the bladder uh, and then tr transect it uh, from the bladder neck. One of the things uh, we'll see here at the end is how far this actually goes into the bladder. This is the other side. Um, we've enucleated that and pushed it up. And right there is the trigone. There's the ureteral orifice. So these things can go very far uh, into the bladder. And then this is what the fossa looks like when uh, the enucleation's over and really not bleeding very much. And so you might say, okay, that must be an unusual case. You just pick that the zebra, doesn't happen. So this guy came in two weeks later. He had a seven, he's 72, has had three prior plasma button vaporizations. And this is what he had when I took him to the operating room. This is gonna look decidedly similar to what I just showed you, okay? Um, his prostate, I think was at least still, I think I, I took over 100 grams of prostate still out. So these are, these are big prostates that were treated with the wrong modality. So we have studied this, outcomes of, of HOLD in the retreatment setting. This was a, uh, we were the primary site for this multi-institution study where we looked at over 2,000 patients between myself, Dr. Lingaman, Dr. Cranbach, and Humphreys. And we wanted to compare the outcomes of HOLD in the primary versus the retreatment setting. We had eight, over 1,800 patients in the retreatment group, 300, I'm sorry, 1,800 in the primary group, 360 in the retreatment group. And the mean time between their first procedure um, and their retreatment was about five years, which makes sense when we hear about what's the retreatment rate, we're always saying what is it at five years, what is it at 10 years, so it didn't surprise us that we were seeing it five years. And most of these men had had TURP and were going under a recurrent procedure because of persistent symptoms. When we looked at how they differed preoperatively, the men that were in the retreatment group had uh, slightly higher urinary flows, the lower residual urine, and we were more likely to do urodynamics in this group because we really want to parse out any bladder dysfunction versus true obstruction in the retreatment patients. So what are the outcomes? Well, in the retreatment group, we saw the shorter operative times, but even though there was a little bit of uh, a difference in tissue resected, we still took a mean of 69 grams of prostate out of the retreatment patients. Um, they had a shorter length of stay, slightly higher post-operative AUA symptom score, and when we looked at complications, this group was more likely to have uh, urethral stricture and clot retention. But again, the urethral stricture is of about 3% in the retreatment group, so not, um, not significantly high. Well, what about, so that's the large prostate. What about the small prostate? Do we ever have to retreat small prostates? Have I treated them for, um, <coughs> with a hole up? Yes. So this is a guy who was being followed for um, bladder cancer, went into urinary retention, had a prostatic urethral lift at an outside hospital. Um, I saw him because he never got out of urinary retention. Here is a CT that he had, um, which is showing you the uh, implants that show up sort of radiopaque. And it's still got a fairly good sized prostate. Here's what uh, we did in the operating room. So again, the idea of urethral lift, you're supposed to be able to make an anterior channel, it's supposed to be wide open. Clearly that wasn't accomplished in his primary procedure. Um, we're gonna start this like a standard uh, whole man laser nucleation of the prostate without median lobe, which is to make a six o'clock incision. 
Um, we'll take that down to the depth of the bladder neck and then the peripheral zone and then we'll incise the apex. So this looks very similar to what I showed you in the other video. Um, the difference in this case is I've gonna come across the implant at some point. Um, and I'll tell you, I've taken these out with um, a laser. I've taken these out with a bipolar and a monopolar loop. Uh, there is no other uh, of the three. I've only been able to really cut the suture with the laser. Uh, Klaus Warburn told me that the green light also works well to cut. Um, but I'm going to uh, start the whole sort of uh, dissection here. And in, in very shortly, you'll see that I'll come across the uh, implant. And again, I'm going to come, be coming across the suture. In whole, if you can see these vessels end on. So you can take your laser fiber, you'll see in a minute I'm gonna fire the laser to get rid of that bleeding vessel there. And then I'm gonna come straight across the Urolift suture. Then I'll go ahead and make my uh, 12 o'clock incision. You can see the implant on the other side was never epithelialized um, on the uh, patient's uh, urethral lumen. So we'll make that 12 o'clock incision. We'll complete the nucleation all the way around, push it up into the bladder, and then uh, disconnect it. Uh, and so you might say to me, okay, well, somewhere in that tissue that you <laughs> just put in the bladder is another metal piece of the implant. If Holup relies on a morselator, what's going to happen, right? So here's the morselation. And when you hit the metal, which you can't see it, it jams up. And then you can just go and take your grasper and pull it out. And that works really well. Okay. So this has also been studied. Mitch Humphreys looked at a uh, whole after prostatic urethral lift, a uh, small series, only seven men. But again, the mean trust was 80 cc, so you might just say it was used in the wrong patient group. They were able sh to show that you could safely perform it, and many times the device implants just weren't in the right location, deployed in the bladder neck. Um, but again, the morselation, you have to be aware of what I just showed you. So then the nagging question is, why are so few people doing HOLIP if it's so great? Um, and I think what's been mentioned predominantly is the learning curve being daunting and steep. So my uh, fellow and now my partner, Jennifer Robice, and I wanted to look at HOLIP trends over time. This is just uh, uh, published uh, electronically in the Journal of Endourology. We looked at Medicare claims data and uh, looked at the number of whole cases um, over time. We had, we had data up to 2014. And although the number of cases in the United States had tripled, the number of polyps per BPH procedure is still only 4% for the entire states. If we then looked at, this is a map. So if you're a dot on this map, you had to have done at least 10 polyps in a year. Um, and the bigger the dot is, the more you do. So this is what 2008 looks like. And then this is what 2011, 2014 looked like, the green being 2014 and the red being uh, combined. So we went from 28 sites to almost 100 sites by 2014. So it is increasing, but it's still a small percentage. So you might say, it, I just can't learn it. I mean, it's a learning curve. That's what it is. Well, the Europeans can learn it. There are something like 20 courses in Spain, Germany, uh, Bulgaria to learn this operation. What's different about the United States? We are in a flawed reimbursement system. We are not being compensated for our 20-year outcomes. We're being compensated for the amount that we do and in what setting we can do it. And in my opinion, that's what's held whole of back. In addition, all of our residents are being trained in robotics. So instead of learning something that you can do through natural orifice, they're learning how to take it out with six or seven incisions. I think natural orifice surgery is better. Uh, and actually, with that, I'm going to end. Um, if you have any questions for me, you please uh, come up at the break.